Okay, my name is David Lester. I'm going to talk here about computability, uh, by which we mean when is a problem solvable by a computer and when is it not solvable by a computer. So the outline of the talk is we have um, a brief introduction, then I'll describe the concept of computability, then we'll have a look at the Church-Turing uh, thesis, um, I'll look at computable functions of more complex uh, types. And finally, we'll make an informal ar argument about why the halting problem uh, is not soluble using a computer. So, at the end of this lecture, you should be able to show that a function is computable. You should understand the use of diagonalization. This is a repeat from lecture two, where we use diagonalization to show that there were more real numbers than um, natural numbers. Um, you should understand how to use the Church-Turing thesis. This is actually quite a good way of solving many of these problems. Um, you should be able to say when a predicate is decidable, and we should be able to give um, an informal argument about why it's not possible to test whether a program halts by writing an algorithm. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Um, a computable function is one that we can write a program to implement that function. That's the simple definition. And for the purposes of this lecture, we're going to think about um, writing programs in our simple programming language, while. By convention, we're going to take the argument to um, a unary function. That's a function that takes just a single argument um, by setting the variable x in the initial state. So vari variable x is given the value that you want to apply the function to. And also by conven convention, it's the variable that's set in the final state when the program terminates. So as a result of executing the program, a starting state s, little s, is turned into a final state s dashed. So let's put that into a uh, formal definition here. Um, a function f is computable if and only if you can write a program, capital S, and for any value n that you set up in the starting state so that the variable x is value n, then it takes m steps to execute to a final state, uh, s dashed, so we want to make sure that this is finite. We're not saying there's an infinite number of states you can get through to get to S dash. It's a finite number of them. Uh, and at the end of it, the value of variable X is the same as the value of the function applied to N. And that's our definition of a computable function from natural numbers to natural numbers. When you need to, you can call this while computability because it's defined in terms of the while programming language. There's also Turing computable. That's describing um, computability in terms of uh, Turing machines. Lambda computable, which is describing things in terms of lambda functions. And there's other things as well. We can uh, use recursive functions, for example. As we can see later, um, these are all define the same set of functions to be computable. That's the important point here. Despite multiple different ways of describing algorithmic computing engines, they end up describing exactly the same set of functions to be computable and exactly the same set of functions to be non-computable. OK. The next property that we're going to look at here is to count how many functions there are from natural numbers to natural numbers. And it turns out there's uncountably many. If you remember from lecture two on um, arithmetic and, and complexity and chaos, then a countable set is one which has a 1-1 one, one correspondence with the counting numbers, and an uncountable, uncountably infinite set is one which has more elements than that. And we're going to prove this using diagonalization. I should say that the use of diagonalization that we made in lecture two was to show that the real numbers were uncountable. 
Here we're going to show that the number of functions is uncountable. And we're going to go into some detail to prove this. OK. So the first part of the proof is to show that there must be infinitely many constant functions. So these are functions which, whatever argument you give them, always give the same answer. And so we say f0 has, uh, takes a, a value n, ignores it, and returns 0. f1 takes a value, ignores it, and returns 1, and so on. And clearly, there must be infinitely many of these because there are infinitely many uh, integers that could be returned as a constant function. So we definitely know that there are an infinite number of functions from natural numbers to natural numbers because there's an infinite number of constant functions. And we know that they're computable because we very simply have to write the uh, simple program assignment, which is x becomes k. And that would have the desired effect and would be the implementation in the while language of those constant functions. Remember, the return value comes back in variable k. Suppose that there was only a countable number of uh, functions from natural numbers to natural numbers. What does that mean? It means that there's an enumeration. That is, there's a bijection between the natural numbers and the set. So we can enumerate them, and we lay them out as a sequence of functions. So we're enumerating from 0 upwards, and we can give them a label. So the first function is f0, the next one's f1, and fk, and so on. That's what the bijection gives us. Now, in order to generate a contradiction, what we're now going to do is construct a function which is not already in our list. First things, when are two functions equal? Well, two functions are equal when, for every argument, they give the same answer. So if f is equal to g, then for any argument, every argument that you can give it, they return the same answer. That's a property known as extensionality. So let's define a new function, which is that f of n is equal to the nth function applied to argument n plus 1. And now, look carefully at what happens. This is the magic bit. This function f is different from fn at the argument n because fn, the function f applied to value n, is one more than the function fn applied to n. So they differ at that point. So it's different to every function in our list at at least one point. So it's different from every function in our list. So we found a new function which was not in our list that we've enumerated. And that's a contradiction. That means that the idea that we could actually enumerate them in the first place was wrong. If you recall, we assumed that it was countable, and now we've generated a contradiction. So now we know that it's actually uncountable. Let's recap here. There's definitely infinitely many functions. If you assume you can enumerate all the functions, it turns out you cannot, because there's this missing function that we've just constructed. And therefore, we've shown there's uncountably many functions from natural numbers to natural numbers. Now, one thing that we also saw in lecture two, in outline at least, was that there are only countably many computer programs. So we have a tension here. We have countably many computer programs, uncountably many functions from natural numbers to natural numbers. So lots more of the functions than there are programs. So there must be something missing here. If we insist on computable functions from natural numbers to natural numbers, there's only countably many of those. There's uncountably many functions in general from natural numbers to natural numbers. So this is clearly a superset of the computable ones. And therefore, there have to be functions 
which are not computable. So that's one argument. That's a accountability argument that says that there have to be things that you can't use computers to solve. Um, another way of looking at this is to ask a particular question and see whether we can find a particular program or problem which it's not possible to solve using a computer. So during the 1930s, there were many different ways found to define what we would now call the concept of computation. Um, the driver for this inventiveness was a desire to fill in some missing detail of Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Basically, he'd said that um, the incompleteness theorem required you to algorithmically generate um, solutions. And the question arose, what do we mean by algorithmically generate? This, of course, was not the words that Gödel used in 1931. Those concepts were coming in in the late 30s. So here are some of the better known ones. Interestingly, Schoenfinkel's combinators uh, actually predate Gödel by six years. Um, but we get the uh, inventiveness of Church's lambda calculus in 1936, Gödel-Cleany um, recursive functions, again 36, and Turing's Turing machine in 1936. Uh, Emil Post produced um, post-production systems in 1943, and I have a, a feeling that Markov's computable functions actually predate the date of 1954, um, but the Russian publication system at that time was not up to publishing uh, this stuff until um, it looks like the demise of uh, Joseph Stalin. Uh, and finally, there's a um, Shepherdson and Sturgis universal register machine in 1963, and the Weil language that I've used, which um, is a, a 1990s invention. So all of these are defining computation in exactly the same way. And this is the Church-Turing thesis. Any sensible definition of computation will define the same functions to be computable as any other definition. It's worth asking the question here, what is the status of this particular thesis? It's clearly not a proper mathematical theorem because we have vague and, and wishy-washy words like sensible in here, and we haven't defined computable. It's in fact um, a rule of thumb that says if somebody comes up with a new definition of computing, it is likely, unless they've been spectacularly clever or silly, uh, that they've come up with exactly the same definition of computing as all these other people. It's what we mean by something to be computable. So to paraphrase it, a function is computable whenever you can write a program to implement it. So whether you write it in Python or Java or C or my while language, it doesn't really matter. Or you use one of the formalisms that the 1930s mathematicians were using. You could write your program in anything. And if you can write the program, then the function is computable. Now, so far, we've looked at the computability of functions from natural numbers to natural numbers. But it's possible to use um, uh, coding mechanisms, such as we saw in chapter two, which permit us to talk about different types. So instead of uh, natural numbers to natural numbers, we could talk about vectors. Um, and basically, what we do is use the coding technique for pairing which you'll have seen before. So the first argument is raised to the power two, which is an even number, and the second argument has two m plus one, which is an odd number, and that allows us to split them apart later on. And so if you want to take a function from a pair of natural numbers to a natural number, that's computable if you use the pairing function. Uh, finally, if you want to talk about um, a function which delivers a pair of uh, um, numbers as its uh, result, then again we can use phi inverse of x, and that will um, calculate us the pair there. And in general, you can scale this thing up to vectors uh, of different sizes. OK. Um, at this point, I'm going to just introduce some notation against my better judgment, 
because, because it's common. Um, what we've got here is that the logicians, as usual, use complicated and different words to describe the same concepts. So, the logicians use the word decidable predicate where anybody sensible would have simply said it's a computable function uh, that delivers a Boolean result. Okay, and this is absolutely classic behavior of logicians. They invent new terminology to describe exactly the same things that other mathematicians and practical people have been using for years. Still, given they got in there, we ought to at least use this. So here's how we describe a predicate P. It's decidable if and only if there's a computable function. So we write a computer program. And it delivers 1 if the predicate holds and 0 if the predicate doesn't hold or, or is false. And um, if it's not decidable, then that's called undecidable. The associated function that goes from natural numbers to natural numbers is the characteristic function for the predicate. And a while program implementing f is called the decision procedure for p. So they're inventing all sorts of complicated terminology to describe stuff that we've looked at and seen and understood already. Um, just be aware that when you talk to logicians, um, they often use complicated words to describe things we all know about. OK, so logical connectives for decidable predicates. Um, if P and Q are decidable predicates, then all of the following are also decidable. Not P, P and Q, P or Q, and P implies Q. Notice that decidable predicates are total. That is, every input value gives a value of true or false. With partially decidable predicates, what happens instead is that for some inputs, the program goes into an infinite loop. So you don't get an answer at all. It's neither true nor false. So a definition of partially decidable predicates is, um, and that's why we've got this hooked arrow notation, it takes some natural numbers to natural numbers, and other times it loops forever. So. If the predicate holds, then the partially decidable predicate will return true or one. However, if the predicate does not hold, the representation of this is as undefined. So it can go into an infinite loop to represent false. This is not the most useful behavior if you have a choice about this, but as we shall see, sometimes uh, this choice is forced upon us. Um, so the function f now is called a partial <coughs> characteristic function of p, and the associated program is a partial decision procedure for p. Now we come on to the, the halting problem. I'm going to make an informal argument here, um, and that's quite complicated enough. Um, basically, the argument we're making here is very similar to other logical arguments where you are trying to generate contradictions uh, and paradoxes. Um, and actually this problem is related quite strongly to one of the ancient paradoxes, which is the liar paradox, which in its modern form would be this sentence is a lie. Um, so what you're talking about is a self-referential form where you're um, cross-referring the statement and its truth value and mixing those two things up. And what we'll see in the halting problem is we're making something similar by way of an argument. So to generate this contradiction, what we're going to assume is that there is a halt tester program um, which tests whether uh, a particular program P with input N stops or doesn't. So it's going to return zero if um, the program fails to halt and one if the program halts. And so what we're saying is that there is a predicate called halts that takes program P and input N, and it's decidable, and it produces a naught or a one. The next program we're going to define is called um, self. 
which takes a program P as input and returns one if the program halts with its input when its input is itself and zero otherwise. And we can certainly write that as a decision procedure using the while language, provided that we have this program S halt at the end. So really, all we're doing here is setting up the input parameters as the pairing operation that we saw earlier, the pairing bijection. And now we get the clever bit here. We define the function here, weird, in this rather bizarre way. Look at the top line of the definition there. It's saying that if you applied the program to itself and it halts with itself as its input, then we get undefined. And otherwise, weird p returns true. So it's completely undefined if the program halts when it's given itself as its argument, and it's true otherwise. Now, what is the result of the partial function is computable, because you can again write it. Here's the definition that we've got. We've got the while true do skip to represent non-termination inside here. So we can certainly write this program. And now's the paradoxical bit. What happens if we apply this program to itself? Well, let's look at this closely. Again, take the top line. Self of weird is saying that the program weird halts when applied to itself, and we're returning undefined as the answer. But of course, weird applied to weird is the left-hand side of this equation. Okay, so if weird applied to weird halts, then it doesn't halt. And the second line is saying that if weird applied to itself doesn't halt, then it does halt because we've returned true. So we've got a two-sided paradox. If you assumed it did halt, then it can't halt because it's the first line and is undefined. And if you assumed it didn't halt, then you get the second line and it has halted because it's returned true. And this is as silly as the liar paradox where if you assume that the sentence is a lie, then it turns out to be true. Or if you assume the sentence is true, then it turns out to be a lie. This is exactly the same pattern that we're seeing inserted here into this equation. Um, so what we've actually shown is that a program, let's just, uh, so yes, let's just go through here. So self of weird is halt weird weird, that's what I've been saying. And now you've got the two cases, if it's true, then you take the first branch and you get a contradiction. And if it's false, you take the second branch and also get a contradiction. So no matter whether the result is true or false, we've generated the contradiction and therefore shown that it's impossible to write a halt test to program in our while language. So what's the, um, the immediate impact of this? Well, <coughs> we saw earlier that there was an argument that there must be more functions of interest than computable functions. So we knew that there were some gaps. What we've shown here is that one of the things that we would actually quite like, an algorithmic way to test whether um, a program is buggy, because let's face it, a program which goes into an infinite loop is a buggy program, and we really don't want them, but there's no way to do this. We're stuck with it. So we rely on human beings to write good programs and to test them properly and hopefully this doesn't occur, but there is no algorithmic way we can ensure that this behavior is eliminated. So it would be really useful if we could get this, um, but we can't. So, um, in conclusion, it doesn't quite show it's impossible to write a whole tester because maybe the problem lies in the expressiveness of the programming language, and perhaps using a different programming language with extra features would permit you to write the uh, halt tester. Um, the notes that accompany this lecture will show that this is not the case, but unfortunately we have to go into a bit more formal proof in order to do this. So that concludes the lecture on computability and the halting test. Um, 
and the applicability for uh, computational neuroscience? Well, we can't do Hawk testing automatically, and the computability of our models is an interesting question. Um, I refer you back to lecture two, where we discuss some of the numeric problems that are resu result in insisting on computability.